And I want to thank you for those extremely kind words, Stephen. My name is Tom. I am alcoholic. My sobriety date is February 10 of 1992, <clears throat> which is 31 years of sobriety and a little bit of change. But I don't think I'm a guru or anything like that, I swear, because I don't know how to get 32 years. And that's kind of what these anniversaries have been like. You know, it's a milestone that's more gratitude than celebration. And I basically see it as a new beginning, a new chapter in my recovery where I now get to learn how to get the next year of sobriety and go through all of the left hooks, the uppercuts, <laughs> the good and the bad. And I don't know the difference between the two, by the way. <laughs> so many things I think are good turn out to be not so good for me. And so many things that are, you know, I see are, are bad turn out to be blown opportunities. So I've tried to stop judging that. And I use mainly step six and seven as the tools for that. I give it just all to God, let him sort it out, which is interesting too, because I'm a staunch agnostic and I have no idea what God is, but I'll tell you guys something. I know that if I do this stuff anyway, whether I believe it or not, it still works. I'm living proof. I thought about what was I going to share about today? You know, there's, there's, I've told my story before. I've told, you know, how I drank as, as a child, as a baby and was already on the heart of alcohol at age six. It was okay to drink in my house and that I was, um, I was a victim of uh, multiple uh, sexual assaults around eight years old. My parents didn't believe me, kept taking me back to the perpetrators and now I started running away from home and they didn't care about that. And I got involved in something called a punk rock scene, which I'm still involved in. Yay, punk rock. See, I love punk because you don't need talent to do punk rock. You only need passion. And anyone who knows me, and especially when I was new and watched me throw those chairs in those AA meetings, knows that I've got passion <laughs> and anger and angst and all those things that I think aren't just alcoholism. You know, I had to sort out the difference between what was alcoholism and what was just me being a jerk <laughs> when I got sober and did all those inventories and the ones I still do today, I continue. And I was thinking, what am I going to talk about? There's those of you who have heard me before, <clears throat> I'm going to try not to bore you by repeating myself. Um, you know, it took many, many years for me to get my story and to be able to condense it down into a, you know, 45 or so minute talk. Uh, there's a lot more to tell. So I'm going to try to shift gears this time. And I think I would like to almost start when I got sober in February of 1992, because, you know, I've been sponsored by a lot of circuit speakers. In fact, I used to seek them out and collect them like baseball cards, right? And I figure if they're putting out albums, you know, speaker tape, so <laughs> they go as, a, as an album, as a record, as a release, then maybe they have something that's so good that they get this popularity in AA that they're like almost gurus or, <clears throat> and I did, I put them on platforms for a while until I learned that, until I learned a few things, you know, they're just like us. They're no different. Some of them do it for pure ego reasons. Some of them are entertaining. Some of them are performing. And some of them are trying their best to reach as many people in the spirit of service as they possibly can and try to carry the message of love and of hope and recovery that Alcoholics Anonymous offers, especially through its 12th step. I had to figure out with all my circuit speaker sponsors that there was a difference between service and sponsorship. And even though I read those pages, 95 to 101 in the big book many times, it didn't really dawn on me until it was explained to me <clears throat> that service is what keeps me disciplined. Because at the end of uh, chapter six, it says we alcoholics are undisciplined after we've been through all these steps and we're on 10 and 11 as a way of life. We're still undisciplined. So what do we do to stay disciplined? Well, we dive into service. 
being committed to things, showing up, taking commitments, things like that, not just in AA, but also outside of Alcoholics Anonymous, in life, in all our affairs. That's how I stay disciplined, by committing myself to things and then being held to it. That's probably the best way to get me to do something is to basically make me. It's always been that way. <laughs> Even though I want to do it, I'm usually so confused. I don't know what to do. You know, on my own, I'm usually in indecision. I want to do what's right, but I just don't know what it is. <clears throat> That's why we have this beautiful fellowship where we can kind of guide each other through using experience, strength, and hope. And the other thing is sponsorship. I'm always looking for people to help take through the steps. And I keep it at a very business level when I'm doing sponsorship work. I do not see it as service at all because page 98 of the big book warns me. It says, because the whole chapter working with others, it says it's about step 12. So I'm assuming it's about step 12 because it kind of said so. And it says, as soon as we put this type of work on a service plane, step 12 work, sponsorship. The alcoholic commences to rely upon our assistance rather than upon God. He clamors for this or that, claiming he cannot master alcohol until his material needs are cared for. And then the book says, nonsense. Some of us have taken very hard knocks to learn this truth. Job or no job, wife or no wife, we simply do not stop drinking so long as we place dependence upon other people ahead of dependence on God. Burn the idea into the consciousness of every man that he can get sober regardless of anyone. The only condition is that they trust God, not a sponsor necessarily, but God, and clean house. And that means do the inventories, do the steps. I keep those things very separate. <clears throat> So what I'd like to talk about today is what happened after my relapse. I originally got sober in 1987. I had a circuit speaker sponsor. He's what I call a spiritual geologist <laughs> because he had a famous talk about dropping rocks. So I call him a spiritual geologist. And even with a sponsor that awesome, I moved across the country and I took his program with me, but I didn't take my own. And when I moved to Los Angeles in 1988, I did not uh, assimilate very well. I judged everybody. I heard about this Clancy guy who was a cult leader. I heard about all this stuff. And I, uh, there was a group called Whatever, where you know they deliberately ignored traditions. And then there was just all these different, it's just, they didn't do it right. You know, Mr. Arrogant Me with my, you know, one year. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, when you're, I already know how AA is supposed to work, right? And if you don't do it my way, you know, then you're wrong. And I had that attitude, and that attitude got me drunk. Today, I now know, and I use kind of a metaphor to explain this. My sobriety back then was like, picture a bicycle wheel with all the spokes, right? And imagine the wheel being attached to the hub where the tire of the bike is, is the rubber meets the road. It's the revolving door fellowship, right? People come and people go on playing games. There's, uh, you know, the uh, flat tires happen and, you, you know, you bend, you bend the frame sometimes, uh, the, the, the rims and sometimes even the spokes. But the spoke connects to the hub. And in AA, the hub, the hub we're all trying to get to is, is something we call the fellowship of the spirit. And it's a very different fellowship, and it's one that can only be joined by doing the 12 steps, according to the books that I read, uh, Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous and other literature. Um, we, we have to do that. Well, <clears throat> my program was like being on a bicycle wheel with one spoke. As long as that wheel didn't move, meaning I stayed really rigid, I could balance on it. Barely. Wasn't easy. But as soon as anything came and challenged my worldview of what Alcoholics Anonymous was supposed to be, I would lose it. Or somebody would turn my wheel a little bit trying to open my mind to maybe learn more about their spoke. My wheel would collapse. 
because the wheel can't stand on one spoke. So yes, I relapsed and I went out because my program was up my butt. It was just up my butt. There's no other way to put it. I, I, and no wonder the world looked like CRAP when your head's up your own backside. I mean, that's just the way it is. You know, it's all about attitude. And so I drifted and the culture shock and everything. And I did relapse. And through a series of miracles, I made it back on February 10th, 1992. I was actually on tour with a band. I came home. Um, it was the day I was supposed to kill myself and the person who picked me up at the airport wasn't sober and had a car full of stuff and wanted a party, but I asked him to take me to a, to a, a place called the alcohol and drug center in West Hollywood, California. And I, um, I knew that they wouldn't kick me out. They had a meeting called Hollywood late night. That was meeting there where basically it was a, you heckle the speaker as long as it's loving heckling. So when the speaker talks, it's a heckling crosstalk meeting. It's crazy. And basically the, the, the idea of the meeting is to let the people who need to bounce off the walls, bounce off the walls while we wait for lucid intervals. We, who, those of us who've actually, you know, have some time. That was my first day. I had been there before, but this time I came back. And when I went up, one of the first miracles in my recovery happened this time. You know, I might get a little emotional today because I plan to talk about some things that happen in sobriety that, you know, they hurt. But in a good way, it's healing pain. It's a different kind of pain. It's not the pain of despair. It's, 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 I, I can't even explain. It's like the pain of gratitude. I don't know if that makes any sense to any of you where, you know, you're just, it, it's this melancholy but beautiful feeling that, we were chosen for something, but why me? Why was I chosen when so many people I love didn't make it? And, and, and it makes me sad to think about these things because you know what? I actually care about you now. I didn't care about you then. You were the means to an end. If you had something I wanted, I would pay attention to you. And when I got what I wanted, I would throw you away. And you would do the same to me before we got sober and that's kind of how it was just mutual using there was no actual bonding relationships anything healthy at all it was just people using people in in a, in a group setting so even though he wanted to party with me and i thought you know this was the day i was gonna over od kill myself do whatever you know put a gun in my mouth i ended up going to this alcohol and drug center and i sat around at meetings uh, they had all kinds of different fellowships that you know they had um you know they the one for sexaholics where you know you see a lot of people sitting by the door waiting for a cutie to relapse right so they can fall into the parking lot and then there was maybe uh maybe they even had a, a fellowship for people like me who talk too much on and on and on you know or whatever they just had a little bit of something i was just waiting for hollywood late night and i planted myself there but when I got there, it was on the second story of a, of a building um, on Santa Monica Boulevard. I remember this. I opened the, the door, and then there's a flight of stairs, and then there's another door that then leads into, they had the whole upper floor. As soon as I opened the door, someone I had never seen before shouted down to me. He said, Tom, get up here. And I'm like, not in the mood. I am not in the mood. Like, what do you want? Who the hell are you? And of course I'm coming up here. Why do you think I opened the door? I was just being snarky as all get out. And I climbed the steps and he just waited for me like he was going to hold the door for me. But then he kind of grabbed my shirt, which you don't do. Those who know the first half of my story know I'm, I'm crazy, man. I'm a punk rock front man, no fear, don't care. And causing as much damage as possible was my mo okay so you don't do that to me but i let him this was my first day back february 10 1992. he grabs me by the shirt and he puts me in the office of this um this little clubhouse now that office is for people who work there i've gone there many times i've never seen this guy before i knew everybody that worked there so i thought nobody said anything he sits me in a chair 
And he sits, pulls up another chair, sits across from me, and he says, Tom, I heard you relapsed. I'm like, how do you know my name? Who the hell are you? And yes, what's it to you? And he got real close to me, and he said, do you know why you relapsed? And my head had a million reasons why. I'm on the road with a band that wasn't sober. My girlfriend just cheated on me. My fiance, almost four years, um, caught her on the roof of the hair salon doggy style with her boss the night before I left for the tour. I had all kinds of reasons why I relapsed, right? But my mouth, I don't know how this happened because I was going to give him that list. But my mouth said, no, no, I don't. And he got this close to me, this close. You don't do that either. But that's what he did. And I let him. And he said, Tom, if you can stay this stupid, maybe you'll get it this time. And he got up out of that chair and he walked out of that room. Thank you. Then he walked down those stairs and I asked, started asking everybody, who was that guy? And nobody knew. Nobody knew. Now, you might think that's a cruel thing to say to a newcomer calling him stupid. But it saved my life. Because I was stupid. I thought that I knew better than Alcoholics Anonymous. I thought I knew better than God. I thought I could run my own life, even having frickin' Sandy as a sponsor who's made it a point to explain to me to never think that way. And yet I did anyway. I was such an arrogant prick, I thought I could judge Los Angeles Alcoholics Anonymous as, it, as if it was beneath me. Talk about raging ego. So yeah, stupid was right. Because chapter 7 says we have to use everyday language to speak to our prospects. And the only language I knew was stupid, shame, guilt, anger. If you tried talking to me from a moral or spiritual hilltop, I would have punched you and walked out of the room. But he, he said the right word. And you know what? Because I loathed myself so much. Stupid was actually a compliment because at least meant I had some sort of a brain. So I allowed myself to be stupid and I started listening, which I really wasn't doing. I was trying to look for the similarities and not the differences. <laughs> when I got home that night, I wrote a song. <laughs> it happened to be on one of my albums called material because when i got home my entire apartment was go was empty the girl who uh, my fiance she moved out while i was on tour she took everything including my stuff and everything left the phone left one fork one knife one spoon one cup and a plate and a note that said see you later bye and my phone rang and it was a girl Oh, by the way, I, I commit a, a sacrilege uh, almost for fun. Uh, I challenge all of the popular narratives in Alcoholics Anonymous whenever I can because our recovery rate, unfortunately, isn't above 50%. So why would I listen to the popular narratives when they don't work? They sound good, but they don't work. See? It's the actions that I'm looking for. I listen to the minority opinion now. And uh, called me, it was a woman named Kristen. She said, oh, you're home. <laughs> I said, oh yeah. She said, I heard all about it. I'll be right over as soon as I can. She took the bus from Venice to Hollywood. It takes a while, it's like 90 minutes. She showed up and she said, Tom, she stole all your stuff. You could go after it and get it, but then you're gonna be sitting in it. And it's going to remind you of her and it, and you're never going to be able to move forward. And you're probably going to relapse again. 
and uh, from the looks of you, you're probably going to su manage and succeed in dying this time. And I had to think about it. And uh, I was at that jumping off place and I agreed. I agreed. And so I let it all go. And I started working the program as if my life depended on it. I did uh, things like throw chairs at meetings to get attention. I uh, ignored my sponsor direction. I made her drag me to the beach to teach me about spirituality. Tom, stop the waves. I can't. Well, there you go. There's a power greater than yourself. Now maybe we can talk about boots, you know. <laughs> and she also taught me what emotions are. You see, because I didn't understand how to explain. If you asked me how I was feeling, I, the only answer I could, if I was being honest, would be to give you, I don't know. Because I didn't have words for them. I don't know if it's the fault of AA, my parents, society. I don't know who to blame. Uh, so I'm simply not blaming anybody. It's just the way it is. I needed what I needed. But when Kristen taught me what emotions were, and I finally got to write that inventory, I was able to get deep enough to really root out some of the problems, to start to actually heal from the over 30 times I was raped by two men at eight years old when my parents took me over and over again, not believing me. And all, a lot of the other things that happened, I started to reconcile the fact that for some reason, after dying three times at age 17 of alcohol poisoning, three times, once for four and a half minutes, why I'm still breathing. And that there's some sort of reason I'm supposed to be here. And it's interesting because God, getting sober is just the beginning. If my circuit speaker sponsors told me anything, taught me anything, it was that they do it wrong. <laughs> See how I am? <laughs> they only get you up to the point where you get sober. You know, if I go to a bar and talk about Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm going to taste the pavement real quick if I talk about the recovery. So if I can't come here and talk about what happens after recovery, after we get sober, then where can I? And unfortunately, I'm not hearing it. I'm hearing a lot of stories. I'm even guilty of it. I'll tell my story, my story, my story, as if that has anything to do with the fact that I have an allergy to alcohol and I have a mental obsession so subtly powerful that it will always give me an excuse to go back to that first drink, even when I don't want to. Even when I don't want to. See, because that's the core of our, of our disease. It's at step 12. It's all right there. Having had a spiritual awakening defined as in Appendix 2 of the big book, so we don't have to get all God, God foo foo stuff if we don't want to, although it's compatible. A spiritual awakening is defined as a personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism. In AA, that's all it ever has to be. Our personality changes through the steps. I don't understand why it works 31 years and I have no clue why AA works. I don't have any definition of God any more clear than when I got here, other than I know that if I just do this stuff anyway, somehow it works. And I don't know why. So what I've done is I became a historian and I learned more about that and, uh, and the how and I learn what idiots the founders really were. And I learn how human they really were. The sauerkraut stories and this and that and all the stuff, the silly stuff that they did. Hank and Bill making stock certificates behind the backs of the trustees of the board they just created because they knew they were going to get in trouble if they did it. And all this stuff that happened. That was just as high drama as the things that are going on at, say, GSO this year. It's never going to change. It's a, it's, a, it's a fellowship of alcoholics. But no matter what we do, it seems that we can't destroy ourselves. <laughs> that is what I hold on to as a concept of a higher power. <laughs> <laughs> so I get into general service. I look at all those politicians. I see all this, the backstabbing and the shenanigans that go on as people jockey for position and the accolades they are seeking and the ego and all that stuff. 
and I realize that they're, they are incapable of doing any damage to AA as a whole in the long run because God is bigger than this. God is definitely bigger than this. So I get sober. I'm throwing chairs. I'm really angry and I'm getting in fights. So what does my sponsor do? She says, Tom, you've been doing punk rock band since you were 10 years old. I'm like, yeah, but I was drunk. She's like, well, you guess what? You're going to do what not drunk. She made me start a punk rock band. I'm like, why would you make me start a punk rock band in recovery? I'm terrified of that, man. I can't look at the audience without being drunk. She's like, Tom, you can legally throw things. <laughs> they won't arrest you for it. <laughs> <laughs> if someone attacks you, you can hit them back and it won't be assault. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> now it sounds like fun. So I did exactly that. I started a band. And that band ended up becoming signed to the – I did a bunch of deals over the years worldwide in various countries. But it also got signed to the second largest label in the world with a record that I spent $700, including pizza, making in a living room, okay? It got signed, probably the least expensive major label record ever released. And this record is obnoxious. It is very offensive um, because I have, you, know, you can't talk to the kids. You have to talk to them in their everyday language. So what I do is I wrap my spiritual messages in rhetoric. So they don't think I'm preaching to them because I'm not. I'm actually trying to share experience. When I was your age, I was even dumber than you were. <laughs> Here's a song about it, you know. And but 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 I got over it. You know, there's hope in there. You know, we're all going through this process together. And by leaning on each other, we can get through this process. So I did all that and I got this band together in, in different lineups and one of them got signed to the second largest label in the world and they betrayed me. They embezzled a bunch of money from me. They tried to steal my copyrights. They, uh, they did a lot of uh, slander, libel, and uh, it really, really, really crushed me. And I somehow stayed sober through the whole thing because... I learned early on this time around in Alcoholics Anonymous that when life throws you a curveball, the only answer is to double down on your Alcoholics Anonymous. Not to deal with the situation directly too fast. We have to take that situation through the process, through the steps. We got to find out our part. What did we do to trigger this? What, what, what can we do about it, if anything, and should we do something? Or is it a situation that's just untenable we should just walk away from? We cannot react to life anymore because that's our disease. We have to respond. And I've learned the word responsible kind of means response-able. Response-able, able to respond. And that's what the steps have given me, the ability to respond to life rather than react to it. So I had to make some very tough decisions, and I actually allowed my name to be dragged through the mud. I allowed them to steal the songs for a while. I even allowed them to steal a bunch more things that I've never said publicly what they are, even though I have the proof in the other room of what those things are. So legally, I mean, I could literally own everything they've got. But why would I do that? Why would, I live, why would I live that way now? Is that really what the master would do? Because they know in their heart of hearts what they've done. And it's their process to reach redemption. It's my job to be ready to receive that redemption if the day ever comes when they ask for it. Because if I don't forgive them, all I can have is a resentment in my heart. And resentment is the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. And that is me. I would be the one dying here. So no matter what people do to me, I have to find a way to love them anyway. I've learned that I have to love even the things in this world that I do not like. 
And I've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous that I don't have to be a teetotaling, you know, walk on water type person. I don't have to like anything, but I do have to love it. And there is a major difference there. <laughs> uh, you know, it wasn't easy though. During that period of time, I made a decision at one point because I only had about four years of sobriety then that I was just going to go get drunk. So I'm Hollywood Boulevard liquor store. I won't tell you which one, but it's got the big green sign with the yellow lettering. <clears throat> um, south side of the street. Um, but <laughs> and I'm going up and I'm walking in the door and I'm ready to buy. I'm going to go buy something. That's it. F this A and A crap. All right. And I open the door and a woman I've never seen before literally pushes me in the chest, knocks me back out on the sidewalk, and she looks me right in the eye, and she's like got a shopping cart thing. I mean, you know, I'm not going to, you know, profile her, but I mean, nobody I've ever met before. And she said, what do you think getting drunk's going to do for you right now? Oh, and she turns around and walks away. I still can't define God, but if you try to tell me there isn't one, I'll think you're out of your mind. I would ask you something like, explain why your heart's beating. What does that have to do with you? How does your thumb know how to be a thumb? How did your pinky know how to be a pinky? And if we're a closed circuit electrical system, why are we not plugged into an outlet recharging like our phones have to? How does this all work? The answer is, we don't know. In fact, we don't even understand electricity yet. We know how to harness it, get blown up by it, you know, do things, store it in certain ways but we don't actually understand it 100 percent, and we don't have to it's those little things that made me understand i don't have to understand spirituality in order to make use of it it all goes back down to that 12 step having had a spiritual awakening defined as a personality change as the result of these meetings Oh, wait, that's not what it says, is it? <laughs> um, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of reading the book. No, wait, sorry, it doesn't say that either. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. We tried to carry this message. What message? I was born with a plastic spoon in my mouth and mommy put me on the potty backwards is not the message the 12 steps talking about. I don't believe. I believe the message is what they just said. If you do the steps, you'll have a spiritual awakening, a personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism. I believe that's the message of AA. This message. Everything else is just bolted on stuff, including my own story. <laughs> My talk theme today is don't run from AA no matter what. See, this is what I'm going to try to get to here in the next 15 minutes that I've got left. <sighs> it's a beautiful thing. Having had a spiritual experience or awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message that if you just do the steps no matter what, don't run, even if they don't make sense, even if they scare the living crap out of you. It doesn't matter. You got to do them if you want to get to the other side. Because it says, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics. Because we're the only ones who can. We're the only ones who can. And practice these principles in all our affairs. I'm not supposed to chain myself to a chair in a church basement for 40 straight years and calling it freedom. So many people are like, home group, swear your allegiance to one group, forsaking all others, sign your name in blood. 
and then never rotate out of your service position and then start telling the other group what to do because you're the old timer and this is how we've always done it groups like that aren't alive a group conscience is in the moment and it could be a guy with one hour of sobriety that could be the minority opinion that changes the entire group if a group is healthy they aren't going to be afraid of anyone's input and there's no reason to guard against the new because we're all just alcoholics and we're all just human beings and we're all just trying to find our way it's such a beautiful program so the homeless woman thing happened i got more and more depressed because i started to realize that i did in my sixth and seventh step i did ask god to have all all of me all of me good and bad to now remove from me all of the defects of character that stand in the way not the ones that don't just the ones that do stand in the way of my usefulness to him and to you and to grant me that strength as i go out from here to do his bidding now i never thought he'd actually give me that I'm going to be honest. I'm human. I'm never going to, who can be perfect in praying and ask God with a whole heart? Oh, yes. If you want to turn me into a newt, do it. You know, if you want to make me the biggest jerk in the world, do it. No. But I asked God and God did answer my prayer because my personality is one that the idea of drinking is ludicrous to me. And I've also learned that facing my fears is probably the most powerful thing that I can do to achieve spiritual growth. And I've also learned that God only, really, if you want to really, really do something big to have a major impact, then face your fears better than everybody else. Because when God gives us something big to do, I know, it's always going to be scary when the pandemic hit it was mentioned that i wrote that zoom security guide which i still work on yeah yay yay me right no it's just i saw a need and i'm i have ms i have complex regional pain syndrome i got other things going on with me and health wise and i had 22 hours a day because i only get like two hours of sleep to do this so i just started doing it and it took off it went viral over 100,000 emails, tens of thousands of groups. I've done more talks on Zoom security. I'm talked out about it, but I'll still do it if you ask me to. And and the point of that is um, that I've, I've learned so much. I've learned that there are 67 GSOs in the world. Did you know that? New York's only one of them. There are 66 more. And I've been blessed with being able to help a lot of them write their safety guidelines and their online guidelines and things like that. This idiot this idiot right here it's not because i'm awesome it's because i learned the secret of alcoholics anonymous do the steps get out of my own way get rid of the stuff that doesn't serve me anymore by allowing god to take it i can't turn anything over i can only be ready in step six to have god remove the defects and then i have to ask and then with my new personality whether i like it or not I now go out into the world and I try to find the things I'm capable of doing and I'll know that it's God's will if I have the power to carry it out. If I don't have the power to carry it out, then the answer is no. And if I don't know what to do and I'm in indecision, then the answer is wait. So my vocabulary between God and I is a three-word vocabulary. Yes, power to carry it out. No, don't have the power to carry it out or I failed. So failure just simply means don't do that. Do something else. I don't have to beat myself up about it or take it personally. I tried. I can give myself credit for that little participation trophy or something. And then and then I move on. Don't do that. And wait. I don't know what to do. So moving on. There was at four years of sobriety or so, five years, I was getting so depressed because I just wasn't doing what I just explained. I was still holding on to stuff and I was still trying to work on my issues. 
work on my defects. I was going to Bodhi Tree a lot, which is a spiritual bookstore, buying tons of self-help books, trying to kind of shoehorn my personality the way I thought it should be by, you know, self-taught personality change. And all I had to do was ask God to do it for me, and it happened instantly. So I learned that the hard way. And it got to the point where I actually had a gun in my mouth. I actually had a gun in my mouth. It was made by Ruger Incorporated. And uh, I even went down to a liquor store and I sat there and I watched people going in and out with their booze. And I told myself, I'm not going to go out that way again. This time I'm just going to end it. A lot of bad things happened. I think they're bad. Happened to me in a very short period of time. And my depression got so bad. Same thing as Bill W. went through when he was writing the 12 and 12. He never did his own steps. Father Ed Dowling became his sponsor, a non-alcoholic, saying, Bill, do you ever tried taking your own 12 steps? Well, no, I haven't. Well, let's do them. Bill did them. Depression lifted. Go figure. <laughs> so, so I had to get back into that. And I ended up writing a song instead of killing myself i had the gun in my mouth the bass is over there i picked up my bass i wrote a song an open letter to god called mainline <laughs> i'm not virtue signaling i am trying to share some things that are coming from the deepest recesses of my soul here this is not virtue signaling but i'm going to read you the lyrics to this open letter to god that i wrote and did get to record with my project you don't have to go listen to it I'm not even, it's not even for sale right now. I took it down. I don't care. But this saved my life. Had I not written these words, I would have killed myself that day. And I know it. This is an open letter to God. I'm talking to God. I've tried and tried and tried to understand how people seem to follow your plan. Tried everything and it just won't kill this want to make my blood spill. I'm headed for the main line. My brain is working overtime. Louder and louder, my head won't stop. Maybe I need a skin pop. I don't like riding on the main line, but it's the thing that's there for me on time. I'm on a train to hell. It's out of control, fueled by ego, and I'm burnt and I'm hurt, and I'm hurt and I'm burnt. You think you fool me with your little plans to take the pleasure out of my hands? It's little use to try to stop me now. I'm past the point of reason anyhow. You know I'm headed for the main line. Just one hit and I will feel fine. The only way that I feel sane anymore, I could always count on it before. Going down to the depths of hell, nothing works to break out of this shell. Back to the place that I know so well. What's your idea? Please do tell, cause I'm hurt and I am burnt. I am burnt and I'm hurt. You know full well I've made a beeline to head back to the main line. And when I get there, I will finally find the peace of mind that should be mine. You know I'm headed for the main line. I know I'm headed for the main line. We know we're headed for the main line. It's out of control because I got to go to my comfort zone. Had I not written that song, I'd be dead. But the pressure kept building and building and building. I wasn't doing regular 10th steps. I wasn't doing my 11th step the way I'm supposed to be doing it. And it, I was paying the price. You know, just being dry isn't enough in Alcoholics Anonymous. Time does not equal distance, I know. It doesn't. I call it so dryity. So dry we're a fire hazard. And it manifested itself at the eight years of sobriety when my left leg blew up, literally. Dark purple, twice its normal size in the middle of the night, I landed in Cedar sinai in L.A. for one whole year. Turns out I have something called, it was called reflex sympathetic dystrophy back then. It took them three months to, to, uh, of inpatient to diagnose it morphine tube in my spine arms are black from all the injections and everything they had to do my leg is above my heart so the blood would flow and as luck would have it long-term care they put me on a floor where the rest of the floor was a betty ford clinic 
<laughs> so as they were wheeling these high bottoms, you know, the ones that were whining about a piece of rum cake making their life unmanageable, I'd be like, get in here. I have eight years of sobriety. Let me talk to you about recovery, please. Can we speak? And I 12 stepped so many people out of that place in that year. And then another year of home care where I played a video game called EverQuest because I couldn't move. I was in another hospital bed in the middle of my living room and a nurse came by twice a day to change the things that needed changed. And the, the, the guild, it's an adventure game. The guild I was in learned that I was an alcoholic in my situation over time. And they had meetings for me inside the game. That was in 2000. I've been going to online meetings since the late 1980s because I'm a computer geek. And I'm telling you, that AA needs to start counting online meetings as legitimate because they're going to discover that the online population of this planet is way bigger than in person. This whole thing about AA is reaching a plateau, it's not true. The in person reached a plateau, online's growing leaps and bounds. I know this and Zoom's only one of the many platforms. I'm closing up here. I wanted to talk about uh, my MS that I also now have, diagnosed seven years ago, eight years ago. And finally, they say you can do 12-step work in the most sordid spots on earth. And believe me, the dive bar I was in that night where she was running a burlesque show, drunk, was pretty sordid. I called it Burning Eyes Burlesque, even though the name of it was Burning Hearts. And... Uh, <laughs> And I told her, you know, I'm not going to have sex with you. I'm going to be the friend that you need because you're a mess. And she started following me around like a sick puppy. She wanted what I had. She didn't know what it was. And I started tricking her into recovery. I said, like, you ever write a journal when you were a little girl? Yeah. If you, you know, your hand can only write one thing at a time. And that war going on in your head, if you just vomit it to paper, it'll unwind the spaghetti. And if you bring it to me, maybe we can make some sense out of it. And, she started following my instructions and calmed down. She quit on her own, everything, eventually. And when she got her integrity and her soundness of mind where she could make decisions, we fell in love. We've been married ever since, 13 and a half years. And we haven't had a single fight since the day we met because we worked the steps together. We read each other our 10 steps, no secrets. We work the traditions in our marriage. We declared ourselves a group. We have group consciences over everything that's going to affect the other person. AA stays first, tradition five. Uh, we get married every day to keep tradition three. We rejoin the group every day. So the honeymoon's never over. <laughs> and we're autonomous in the way we express that. And I can go on and on. And we even work concepts. And we just love being of service because it keeps us disciplined. And we love sponsorship. And we love Alcoholics Anonymous and the life it's given us. And even though life's been really tough, I've been going through a lot of health stuff lately. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because I know that my higher power has given me these burdens to prove that somebody carrying this weight can stay sober one more day, can stay sober one more day because I do my deal. I do my deal. I live in 10, 11, and 12. So if you're new, please find someone that totally pisses you off because chances are they have, they know how to push your buttons. That's why you're pissed. And then they'll help you find out why those buttons are there and how to get rid of those buttons. So if you don't want a sponsor, you want an adversary, <laughs> okay? <laughs> a loving adversary that's going to be honest with you and help you find out what's really going on, what's broken in here, because that's how we recover. We recover by getting rid of all that garbage, uncovering it all, discovering what it is, and then asking God to remove that which is no longer useful to us, and then trying not to judge what's left because it's all there for a reason. And then we forgive ourselves for just being human beings with alcoholism. It really is okay to not be perfect. I'm living proof. <laughs> I love you all. I want to thank you for having me. Thank you so much. I love you, Stephen, and everyone else that has anything to do with this meeting. Thank you all for being here.